Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you again for tuning in to Give Me the Bible. I'm Dan Manuel, and so thankful to be able to be here today to be your host uh, right here on this telecast, and we hope that you'll get your Bible, uh, because that's what this program is really all about, Give Me the Bible. And you'll notice throughout our telecast today, we'll be talking about the Bible. So it really is important that you have one in your hand, where you can run the references that our panelists will be sharing with you today. We thank you so much for being here a part of our program, and we encourage you to watch Give Me the Bible each week at this same time. Now, in the book of Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 23, King Solomon said many, many years ago that whosoever keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. You know, our mouth often gets us in trouble, doesn't it? Sometimes we say things we ought not to say, and uh, perhaps maybe we'd like to recall some things that we have said in the past, but you can't really gather up your words again. It's kind of like spilt milk. It just happens, and uh, we just have to learn from our mistakes and, and do better and really try to control our tongue. James says that the tongue is an unruly evil, and uh, so we have to be very, very careful about what we say. We're going to go to Joe Hancock right now. And uh, Joe, I know that it isn't uncommon to hear people in today's world curse and swear and say things they ought not to say and use all kinds of vulgarity. But what does the Bible really teach about this subject, the idea of cursing and swearing? Well, Dan, uh, the Bible's a guinea. Uh, The Bible uh, teaches us that we're not to have that kind of language, and I would even use the word garbage, uh, come out of our mouths. Uh, The Apostle Paul in Ephesians uh, chapter 4 at verse 29 wrote these words, uh, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. Surely cursing and foul language imparts no grace to the hearer. You know, Dan, in the Old Testament times, if a, if a child had cursed his parents, well, let me read to you what it says in, in Exodus chapter 21 at verse 17. Uh, he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. It was a capital offense to curse one's parents back in the Old Testament times. Uh, again, uh, uh, Solomon in Proverbs chapter 30, there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. It, it, it relates this, this cursing to, the, to an idea of haughtiness. You know, and what good is cursing anyway? I might ask that. Uh, what, what words do we not have the ability to use that we have to use cursing and foul language to get our point across? Makes no sense. Uh, cursing has no place. Uh, Peter, even on the the night that Jesus was taken and and Peter was away from where Jesus was being uh, chastised and and, and, uh, beaten on and spat on, and Peter denies Christ, but the third time it says he was cursing in the process. Romans chapter 3. I want to draw your attention to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 down through 14. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who speaks after God. They have all turned aside. They have come together, become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Dan, you mentioned a minute ago uh, uh, James. What James uh, talks about the unruliness of the tongue in James chapter 3. Uh, he begins in verse 1 and goes down to about verse 10 or 12, I guess. Uh, it, it, it's just a fact that we have a hard time controlling our tongue. But, but folks, the Bible is specific. The New Testament, we're not to be folks of a cursing manner. There's no reason to use foul language to get your point across for any reason, even if you're upset. Use dignified words, but words that impart grace to the hearer, Dan. Thank you, Joe. So, uh now that we've got that out of the way, and we need to be very, very careful to understand that that is wrong. 
But I want us to move on to something else. You know, one of the ways that people often use uh, their tongue is to deceive other people or telling lies. And we're going to go to Neil Thurman right now to uh, tell us why that's wrong. Then it's a real problem because so many of us think of it as though it's not a big deal. Uh, it's, well, it's just a little white lie. But we read in the scriptures and that lying is absolutely against God. Proverbs chapter 12, verses 17 through 22 uh, beginning there says, He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Down at the end of that passage, uh, we're told that lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. If you turn over to Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and following, we'll find there the scriptures telling us that there are six things that the Lord hates and seven are an abomination. Isn't it interesting to find that two of those are a lying tongue and one who bears false witness? In other words, telling an untruth or a lie. Recognizing that two of the seven things that we're told are an abomination to God involve lying, of the tongue being used for, for dishonesty. You know, and sometimes lies are just to cover up other sins. Proverbs 10 and verse 18 tells us that whoever hides hatred has lying lips. And we find that that liars kind of join together, want to listen to, uh, to one another. Proverbs 17, verse 4, an even do, evildoer gives heed to false lips, and liars listen eagerly to a spiteful tongue. You know, we recognize that, that lying dishonesty, it really de- tears at the very fabric of integrity, even community and culture recognizing that it affects the very base of everything that we do. When we step back and think about it, of whether or not it's a big deal, we ought to recognize that God will punish liars. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 5 tells us, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. It says in verse 9, A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. We're told that they'll basically eat their own words. Proverbs 20 at verse 17 saying that bread gained by deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth will be filled with gravel. In a very clear text that we can find when we think about what, what does God think of lying? Revelation chapter 21 at verse 8 tells us, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second dead. So Dan, the scriptures make it very clear that God takes it very seriously when we lie or speak words of deceit. Thank you, Neil. You know, if we've not touched on your sin yet, whether it be uh, cursing or swearing or lying, think about this next one. Is it possible that you're guilty of gossip? And for that, we want to go to Perry Cowan right now and and help us understand why gossip really is wrong. We joke about it a lot, but isn't it really a sin against God and against others, Perry? Heaven forbid we get caught up in that, folks. It's, uh, it's a terrible sin against God. We want to consider what Solomon said in uh, Proverbs chapter 18. He said, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Several years ago, there was a, a, an artist by the name of Joe Jones that recorded a song that said, You talk too much. Well, that's oftentimes the case. And I'm reminded of uh, what Moses, when Moses gave God's law to the people, he warned them about talking too much. In Leviticus chapter 19, he said, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among the people. We're not to be gossiping, not to be telling stories that uh, are, are not so. Now, now some things are uh, ought to be concealed, whether they're so or not, whether there's truth to them or whether they're it's completely false. Because just because something may be true, does not mean that it must be revealed. Uh, no, you know, if, if we are called upon to speak the truth, we need to speak the truth. But there are, if there's not a good reason for that truth being spoken, if it's not going to be beneficial to someone or help someone, uh, rather it's going to hurt someone or bring destruction to them, it would be better left unsaid. It, it's likely to uh, cause damage. Solomon again wrote in Proverbs chapter 11, a talebearer 
uh, revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. You know, if we just want to tell the tales and, and get all the, all the stuff out there on someone, uh, as we've seen recently in, in, in congressional hearings, uh, we, we need to understand that just because uh, uh, something might be so, it doesn't necessarily have to be said uh, if it's not going to be helpful, if it's going to be damaging. Uh, the secrets of the matter uh, might be real, but it might not be um, beneficial. Uh, so let us deal with, with those things as if we love each other. You know, we're commanded to love our brother. And, and uh, Solomon again said, He that covereth the transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth the matter separateth very friends. Let's not say those things that's going to cause divisions and hurt in people's lives. Dan? You know, if we could just remember those things that have been shared with us there, then life would be a whole lot better for us. It really, really would. Now, I want to go to Randy Foreman, and I want you to enlarge on this idea, though, this concept of talking too much. We've all been around people sometimes, and they feel like they know all the answers to everything, and they've got a solution for everything that is going on in our world. And uh, have you ever been around people like that that just talk too much? I mean, they just run on and run on like I'm doing right now, and I'm going to go on and go to Randy Foreman right now. Thank you, Dan, and good to have you folks on our program this morning. Open mouth, insert foot. How often to impress do we betray wisdom and prudence and just can't wait to talk too much? The wise man in Proverbs 12, 13 says, The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. In Proverbs 18, 6 and 7, we read, a fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Who is a fool but one who talks too much? With many words he steps into many lies. King David wrote, A fool has said in his heart, There is no God. Yet the prudent restrains or holds his tongue. Now, prudence in the Bible means the ability to govern and discipline by the use of reason or, yes, good sense. Methinks, brethren, that the man of a few words speaks with temperance, meaning with moderation and restraint in all things, which includes our actions, yes, our thoughts, and finally, our feelings. He who is of few words employs the best policy, we would do well to heed the advice of Proverbs 17, 27 and 28. He that has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holds his peace, is counted wise. And he that shuts his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. Finally, as Job sarcastically says to his so-called friends, if only you could be silent, that's the wisest thing you could do. Job 13, 5. And with tongue in cheek, I'll say this about talking too much. That's all I got to say about that. Back to you, Dan. Well, thank you very much, Randy. And uh, sometimes it is best for us to bite our tongue, hold your tongue. Uh, you know, someone said our word should pass through a number of gates of gold. Is it true, first of all? Is it necessary, and will it really be helpful or encouraging? And I think that probably is a good philosophy in life, don't you? Now, we want to go to our next speaker right now, Chris Groda. And Chris, I think not only do people talk too much, but sometimes we talk too soon, don't we, before we hear the matter? Yeah, Dan, that's right. By the way, I really liked that last point a minute ago. You know, my dad always said I was vaccinated with a phonograph needle. So I need that point. I really appreciate that. But, uh, you know, Proverbs 18, verse number 13 says that if you uh, answer a matter before you hear it, it's folly to you. I think about that all the time when I think about things that are in the news, people who've been accused of certain acts, but they've not been proven guilty. I'm worried about our culture because we're getting away from innocent till proven guilty. And there's a lot of uh, people that serve in the court of public opinion they're not afraid to say what they think, and 
It may even be slanderous. It may be unrighteous. It may be unfair. Uh, but people do an awful lot of this. They do well to listen to Proverbs 18, verse number 13. And then James says in James 1, 19, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. Uh, what sage advice? How many times have you been in conversations with people that you could just tell they weren't listening? It was almost as if they were thinking of the very next things they were going to say without even thinking about whether it relates to what you've just said. Uh, well, you know, Proverbs 10 and verse number 19 says, words, when words are many, transgressions are not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the heart of the righteous ponders how to give an answer. You know, Joseph was guilty of having an affair with Mrs. Potiphar, and Potiphar didn't bother to, to look into it at all. In fact, Proverbs 25, 2 says, it's the glory of kings to search things out, but he certainly didn't do that, and we need to take a lesson from that. How can I use my tongue for the good? Well, I can use my tongue to bring peace to men. Proverbs 15, verse number 1 says, a soft answer turns away wrath. Um, I need to be a peacemaker, not cloud the issues. I need to give wise reproof to the erring, like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is, is a wise reprover to a listening ear, Proverbs 25 and verse number 12. I need to use my mouth to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to teach the things of the Lord. Proverbs 16 verse number 23 says, the heart of the wise makes his speech judicious and adds persuasiveness to his lips. What if I used my lips to persuade people to obey the gospel? You know, like cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news. And I would insert the good news of Jesus Christ from a far country, Proverbs 25, 25. Those are just some things for you to think about. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Rocky uh, Whiteley is here from Bryan, Texas this morning, and uh, I want Rocky to address something regarding the tongue. You know, so often we fail to stand up and really speak when we ought to. There was an old song that was recorded a number of years ago. It was called Silence is, is Golden. And it is in some ways, but in some ways it's not. For well, we ought to be standing up to speak out about our God, shouldn't we, Rocky? Oh, absolutely, Dan. And good to be with all of you. Uh, that we're not speaking up for God. There are times that we should be teaching others the good news of Jesus, but we neglect to do so. And as I think about our previous preachers here, uh, that instead of cursing and swearing, let's praise God when we use His name. Instead of lying, let's tell people the truth of God's Word. Instead of gossip, let's tell the loving story of Jesus and all that He's done for us. Instead of talking too much, I think that we don't talk enough about the good news of Jesus. Instead of not talking soon, we need to talk soon about the good news of Jesus. I think in terms of the command of Jesus, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and verse 19, how that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. The older translations there say to teach. Or we look at Mark's account in Mark 16 and verse 15, that we are to go and preach the gospel to all creation. This is what we need to be doing. I think in terms of the Apostle Paul as he was calling the elders of Ephesus to him, it wasn't going to be much longer that he would see them anymore, and they were very unhappy about that. But as he spoke of his time together with them, he said these things in Acts 20 and verse 20, you know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. And again in verse 27 he said, For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. We know the importance of having a watchman, uh, Ezekiel and Ezekiel 33, and I'm going to look at that text in just a moment. But think in terms of how World War II began with the attack on Pearl Harbor, the sneak attack. If the watchman, if the soldiers had been aware of what was happening to the north, the planes that were coming, how many lives would have been spared at that time? How much easier would it have been to win the war? In Ezekiel 20, uh, 33, in verses 7 to 9, God tells Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. 
So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. You do not speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways. The wicked person will die for their sins and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their wicked ways and they do not do so, they'll die for their sins. But though you yourself will be saved. You know, I think in terms of the good news for those who accept the gospel, it is truly good news. What about those who reject the words of God? The good news has become bad for them. Let's speak out for God. Dan? Rocky, thank you very, very much for helping us to realize those great truths of Almighty God. Now, we want to go to our last panelist here today, certainly not our least. Uh, he always does a great, great job, all the way from Pointer, Texas. And uh, John Hafner is going to help us realize that someday we'll give an account of our words. You know, the Bible says that, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Someday we will be judged by our words, won't we, John? Yeah, that's right, Dan, and thank you everyone for tuning in today. The relationship between words and judgment is a very interesting one to me. Just consider two passages briefly. John 12, 48, Jesus says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And then you compare that with Matthew 12 from 36 and 37, where it says, By your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So you put these next to each other, we've got judgment based on the words Christ has spoken, and you've got judgment based on the words we have spoken. You say, well, which is it? I say both, because this judgment takes place by comparison. The words that we have spoken, do they match the words that our Lord has spoken, or do they go against it? And you look at the examples that we've been laying out through the course of this episode, whether we're talking about cursing or gossip or lying or whatever the case may be, do the words we speak match the message of God's word? And someone who only had our words, would well, they look to that and say, I can see the gospel. I can see Christ. I can see salvation here. Or would they say, this looks just like every other worldly wicked person I have opportunity to be around. Uh, it matters that we would bring what God has given us. That's what he's looking for with judgment, that he would see himself in us, that we learned this lesson, and that we speak the things that would reflect that. Uh, let me share another passage with you. It comes from Luke chapter 6. Uh, this is repeated, by the way, from Matthew 12. You'll find it in both accounts. But in Luke 6, 45, it says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. The words that you and I choose to say truly matter. Based on the teaching of the Bible, we have to say they matter eternally. Now, as we're speaking, choosing those words, directing them toward those around us, our heart is being revealed. Does it show a heart belonging to God, one that shows friendship with Him, a profitable relationship in the kingdom? Or does it show a heart still belonging to Satan, a heart caught up in the things of the world, a heart of wickedness? Keep a careful watch on your tongue. Let's all be more careful with the things that we say, because we will be judged by our words. Back to you, Dan. All righty. Thank you, John, so much. And thank all of our panelists today. They've done an excellent job in helping us to understand the, the power of the tongue. Let me repeat that passage again, taken from Proverbs 21, 23, that whosoever can keep his mouth and hold his tongue keepeth his soul from trouble. There will always be trouble when we don't watch our words and when we speak before we think. You know, a lot of people say things before they even think about what they've said, and then they go back. And uh, sometimes I've, I hear people say, well, I didn't really mean anything by that. Well, why would they say it? Did you know the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so whatever flows from our lips is something in reality that comes from our heart. We had it in our heart, we digested it, and it just came forth from our lips. <laughs> and sometimes our words can be very hurtful with people. You know, words bring about divorce, a lot of divorces in our country today, because harsh words are often spoken in marriage relationships. Maybe a husband says something he ought not to say to his wife, or Vice versa, a wife says something that she regrets saying to her husband, but words hurt so deep, don't they? 
Uh, and sometimes we say things to one another in the church, and it becomes a, such a divisive thing, and the church becomes polarized, and people sometimes leave the church simply because of words that were said in haste without really giving a lot of thought to what we say. We build friendships, but sometimes those friendships are dissolved simply over words, and that's why we should be so very, very careful uh, to watch our words. Watch what you say. Think about it before you say it. And someone said that the reason words just slip out is because the tongue is in a slippery place. <laughs> and you know what? It is true, isn't it? And we're all guilty. So this program today has been designed to help you understand how much damage can be done by the use of the tongue. You know, you can't really control the tongue. You, you, you can't, I mean, or tame it, so to say. We do have to really be in control of it at all times. And uh, James says it's kind of like wild beasts. We can tame them. Have you ever seen that, how they could tame elephants maybe to stand in a certain place? And you can tame <laughs> lions and tigers to jump through hoops and all those kinds of things. But he says, you know what? You may be able to do that with animals, but you can't do it with the tongue. And so we have to stay over guard watch our tongue. David said one time, he said, set a guard over the door of my lips. And you know, if we'd stop and think before we speak, we might resolve a lot of the issues that go on in our world, in the church, in the family. Sometimes harsh words are said in our families uh, that we have to, we just have to be really, really careful about, don't we? So as you think about your life today and the many words that you employ, and by the way, I, I read the other day that a woman will speak about 35,000 words in a day's time, and a man would speak about 15,000 words. I said that to my wife, and she said that's generally because a man has to repeat everything he says. <laughs> well, maybe that's true, but uh, maybe there's some things we shouldn't repeat. Thank you for being a part of our telecast today, and I hope you'll watch your words this week, and I hope you'll watch your clock and your calendar, and that you'll join us next week at this same time, right here on this same television affiliate for another presentation of Give Me the Bible. Sing to me of heaven, sing the sweetest song of all.